So the irony here is that while the South faces more greater and greater economic problems as the war goes along, the North is prosperous. The Northern economy grows in the war. Prosperity expands. More land is brought under cultivation. More railroads are built. More exports of grain to, to Britain, counteracting to some extent the loss of the cotton uh, trade. War contracts, uh, uh, many industries grow rich on you know, providing things for the army, clothing, blankets for soldiers. The railroads make an enormous amount transporting goods. And by the way, part of this nationalization, the government forces a uniform gauges on the railroads. Remember I said before the war, different railroad companies had different gauges, that is the, uh, the, uh, the tracks were different, you know, were different distances apart and therefore you couldn't just run right through. Now they say, hey, this is making it hard to get things to the army. We gotta redo the tracks to make one gauge throughout the country. So again, a sign of this consolidation uh, and nationalization. The year 1862, this is from Railroad Magazine. The year 1862 will be remembered as one of the most prosperous that has ever been known in railroading. The railroads never earned so much in the course of their existence as they have during this much dreaded year. Government contracts turn many unprofitable businesses into profitable businesses. Um, Everybody knows, you know, that the, if you want to make money, get a deal with the Defense Department. You know, you can sell them a light bulb for $200. You know, they don't care what it costs. They need it. Same thing in the Civil War. These are cost plus contracts. That is, whatever it costs, they then add on a percentage of profit, and that's it. There's no, no need to cut your, you know, your costs and everything. So there's a lot of profit in supplying uh, the Army with one thing uh, or, um, or another. Um, Abram Ewart, the Cooper Ewart Museum down here on Fifth Avenue, wonderful place, his mansion. How, where did he get all that money? He's an iron maker. He, he becomes tremendously rich during the war as an iron manufacturer selling to the uh, government. Now for ordinary workers in the North, it's a very different story. Because of inflation, because prices rise rapidly because of all this money circulating around, real wages fall. Wages go up, but not nearly as much as prices, so real wages, that is the actual buying power of money, uh, of wages, uh, 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 falls. The war creates a class of millionaires in the North for the first time, but it also creates a lot of uh, difficulty for, uh, for workers, and in fact, it, the birth of the modern labor movement in the United States really comes out of the Civil War. There had been labor organizations before the war, but the industrial labor movement, the labor movement of the Gilded Age in the late 19th century really is born out of the problems that workers confront in the North uh, during the Civil War. Now all of these changes, the consolidation of the national state, the rising power of the industrialists, the emancipation of the slaves and the changing condition of African American people in American life, uh, all of those produce countervailing uh, protests. All of those are very disturbing to some people in the North. So there is a lot of internal opposition in the North to the policies of the Lincoln administration. As I said last time, they're not people who want the Union to be broken up. There are a few, but not that many. But they do not like the way the war is being conducted and the consequences that are flowing from the, the war itself. Now, unfortunately, the lexicon of the Civil War Reconstruction era is filled with words that are almost impossible to avoid. One, which we'll get to down the road, is carpetbagger, which has to do with Northerners who went down to the South in Reconstruction. That's become part of our lingo, even though it's a politically charged word, it's hard to get rid of. Another one is copperhead, copperhead. This is what Republicans called anyone who criticized the Lincoln administration, copperheads. Copperhead is a poisonous snake. So this is not a term of praise by any means. People who opposed the war policies, opposed conscription, 
the draft, opposed the suspension of habeas corpus, opposed emancipation, opposed the plight of, or were alarmed by the plight of workers. Their slogan was, the Copperhead, or the opponent's slogan was, the Constitution as it is, the Union as it was. They didn't say break up the Union. They said, let us go back to the Union of 1860. Of course, what does that mean? Without emancipation. The Union as it was. And they constantly said, if you offer that to the South, they will come back. If you offer them to go back to the pre-war period uh, situation, especially as the war goes along. Now, of course, Republicans said, well, what is the point of restoring a situation that produced war in the first place, right? You go back to 1860, you're going to have another war because the same conflicts will exist. But anyway, that is their slogan. To radicals, they were traitors. To many Republicans, most Republicans, they were traitors. They were a fifth column, as they're called. That is an internal enemy. More recently, historians have viewed them in other ways, not as agents of the Confederacy, but as people with critique of the or were suffering from the consequences of the war. Um, in the West, that is to say, I'm talking about Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, most of these, a lot of this is just members of the Democratic Party. In the Old Northwest, they tend to be concentrated in the southern part of those states. Very often their ancestry is from the South. Uh, they're very deeply racist, but they're also mostly farmers who are not plugged into the new industrial order that is rising and resent the benefits that are going to it. In the East, anti-war sentiment tends to be in the cities, not in the rural areas like in the West, particularly in New York and particularly among immigrants and particularly among Irish immigrants um, who are, again, very tied into the Democratic Party, uh, also often quite racist in relations with blacks, uh, often competing with blacks for very low-skilled, uh, low-paid work in uh, urban uh, centers. Now, the, what's fun, interesting is, despite this strong Irish element, the war actually, I think, under uh, or um, minimizes, or maybe, what was the word I'm looking for, just uh, kind of diminishes nativism, because many, many Catholic Northerners join up in the war. Here's a, this is a great photo of a mass in an army camp being conducted by a Catholic priest. Lincoln is smart enough to know. Now, there were Protestants who said, we don't have, you shouldn't have priests in the army. The priests, the representative of the Pope, the Antichrist, what is this? Lincoln is smart enough to know that any religious denominator, any soldier will want to have services by somebody from their religious group. So this is a, a Roman Catholic service in an army camp, and the throwing together of people of different backgrounds, different religions, eases up race, uh, nativism, just as the service of black soldiers eases up racism, I believe. Um, the service of Irish Catholics eases up nativism, despite strong Irish opposition uh, in many ways um, uh, to the war. Now, racism was definitely very important in the rise of this anti-war or anti-administration sentiment. Uh, we've seen how in 1862, the Democratic Party utilized racist appeals very vigorously in the campaigns which, and won uh, significant victories in 1862 right after the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation was issued. One father, a Democrat, wrote to his son after that, at that time. He said, I'm sorry that you are engaged in the war which has no other purpose than to free the Negroes and enslave the whites, to overrun the free states with a Negro population and place us all who labor for a living on an equality with damn Negroes sent on us by abolitionists. So this is, you see, those of us who labor for a living, in other words, this fear of a black influx into the North, undermining wages, competing for jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is widely expressed in 1862 and 1863.